This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Well, hopefully you took my advice and you've gone back and revised the sections that you see here in section one of chapter 20, back in chapter 12. Dealing with part disposals, chattels and non-chattel wasting assets. Now, all of those terms should mean something to you. Again, if you revise back from what we did in uh, Chapter 12. If you haven't already done that, I'd really suggest that you go back and look at those areas before continuing with this particular lecture. But hopefully all of that is behind you. It's history and you've done that. Right, first area to deal with part disposals. We have seen on so many occasions when dealing with the calculation of a chargeable gain or indeed allowable loss that the problem that we face is in determining the allowable cost. We know how much we have sold an asset for. Our problem is, what is the cost? We saw that back in the previous chapter there when dealing with shares. How do we work out the particular, the specific cost of these shares now being sold within a company when we had different figures of uh, uh, allowable costs incurred over several purchases that make up the current shareholding, out of which we sell some, but not all of the shares. It's that problem, as it always is, of determining what is the allowable cost. So what's the issue with part disposals? It is, of course, that we're selling some of an asset we had originally acquired as a complete entity. We're selling some of that, but not all of it. Now, you might again ask, how is it we can sell some? of an asset that we bought. The usual example of this, as you'll see in example one here in a moment's time, as you dealt with indeed back in chapter 12, is where you buy land. You buy a quantity of land, whether measured in acres or hectares, whatever it might be, and you then sell off some, but not all of that land. You know the original total cost of the total quantity of land originally purchased. You now need to establish what proportion of that should be set off against the proceeds on the sale of that particular part. We might think that that is an easy quantitative decision to make. I am now selling, for example, 60 acres out of 100 acres originally acquired. So 60 out of 100, you think, well, I'll take 60 100, so I'll take 60%. But no, we don't do that. The quantitative basis that we use is not on a physical volume, 60 acres out of 100 acres, but is in fact taken as a value-based apportionment. So the rule, when a company disposes of a part, but not all of an asset, typically a quantity of land, the allowable cost of the part of the asset disposed of is computed, as we saw for individuals in Chapter 12, by taking the cost of the entire asset and multiplying out by. On the top line, sale proceeds of the bit now being sold. Over on the bottom line, the self-same figure of sale proceeds of the part now being sold, plus the value remaining, the market value of the remaining part of that asset. So I'd sold 60 acres, I know what I sell them for, the question will also tell you what is the market value of the 40 acres of the 100 acres that you originally acquired. What's the value of those 40 acres that you retain? The same calculation will be performed for a company, but in addition to the, but in addition, of course, to that, it is the, uh, the allowable cost being computed. It's also that point about indexation allowance. But again, indexation has been made so much easier now since or from the June 2019 exam, given that they will give us indexation factors and given also that indexation allowance was frozen as at December 2017. So example one, same information as, we're de as we dealt with back in the equivalent example back in chapter 12, but we're now dealing with a corporate owner, ST Limited, owned here the land in question. We've got to calculate the chargeable gain on the disposal of the two hectares of land in March 2019. So what have we got? ST Limited owned 10 hectares of land, which had originally cost £26,000 back in March 2011. Now, whereas the particular date of that acquisition would not have been relevant when dealing with an individual, 
It is, of course, very relevant now for purposes of computing the indexation allowance. The company sold two hectares of the land in March 2019. Again, as is most likely, the date of disposal is going to be after December 17, and that means limiting the indexation allowance from the date of acquisition through to December 2017, rather than what is here the later date of disposal. What we do need to know, of course, is how much we sold it for. You also need the value of the remaining part of the asset that you continue to own. We'd originally acquired 10 hectares, we've sold two, so the remaining eight hectares, well, they were valued at £34,000 in March 2019. We're then, of course, provided with indexation factors, one of, of course, going through to the date of disposal. That, of course, is irrelevant. The one that we want is the one that goes through to December 2017. OK, now I would hope you are able to do the calculation here of the chargeable gain for ST Limited. Again, I've talked you through the question. I've talked you through your approach to the answer, but it should, I hope, be fairly straightforward. First thing we need to know, of course, is what did we sell for? We sold these two hectares of land for £16,000. So there is your sales proceeds, as ever, a given figure. The question is, how much of the original cost of £26,000 incurred for the 10 hectares of land when purchased in March 2011, how much of that cost should we now set against our sales proceeds of 16,000? This is where you use this apportionment here, this calculation on the top line, sale proceeds, well, that was 16,000. Over the bottom line, sale proceeds, 16,000, plus the value remaining. That is 34,000. Multiply it through your calculator, get your allowable cost, what part of that 26,000 will now be expended against these proceeds of 16,000? Take it away and you get your unindexed gain. You've got your allowable cost computed as a result of that calculation. You then apply the relevant indexation factor to that cost, and then you have got your chargeable gain. Right, you pause this now at this point, work that through, check it out with the model answer, and then we'll quickly review when you come back to us. OK, well, I hope no problems for you in getting the answer that you see here. Again, calculations permitting here, assuming that they're correct. Uh, what do we sell for? Proceeds were 16,000. What was the original total cost? 26,000. What part of that is expended? The answer, sales proceeds over sales proceeds plus value remaining there. Sales proceeds, as we know, 16. You pick up the value remaining as provided to you, that's 34,000. Multiply it through, and that will give you your allowable cost. Once you've got your allowable cost figure, then you can do your indexation allowance, applying the correct indexation factor, the one to December 2017, of course. Take it away, we get our chargeable gain. Thank you very much. Job done. Okay. Make sure you're happy with that, and then we'll continue on. So back to our notes. Right, we now move to section 1.3, and we're dealing with chattels. Now, chattels, tangible, movable property there. And chattels have some special rules, whereby, to begin with, if they are both bought and sold for less than £6,000, the disposal would be exempt. There'll be no gain, there'll be no loss, the disposal is exempt. If we buy for less than 6,000, but sell for more than 6,000 pounds, then, as well as doing an actual normal gains calculation, this time for corporate tax, dealing with indexation allowance in computing that gain, we compare that with a maximum gain figure. And what is that maximum gain figure that we use? It is, of course, an odd fraction, as you may recall. We take 5 over 3 multiplied by your 
gross proceeds, whatever you've sold that chattel for, minus 6,000, i.e. the chattel exemption limit. So five thirds of gross proceeds minus 6,000 is the maximum gain. If the actual gain is less than that, the maximum gain is irrelevant. If the actual gain is bigger than that, then the maximum gain will, of course, limit the amount of chargeable gain that now applies. The only other outcome that we could see where something other than a normal gain or loss calculation is performed is where there is a loss, but this time we buy for more than 6,000 and we sell for less than 6,000. Here, thankfully, there's only one calculation to perform. And that one calculation has a difference in terms of the very first figure you place into the calculation of what, of course, is going to be a loss. We bought for more than 6,000. We have sold for less than 6,000. Clearly, it will give rise to a loss figure. And that is that we deem the gross proceeds, a figure, of course, that is less than 6,000, but we deem the gross proceeds to be £6,000. We deem the gross proceeds to be £6,000. Now, that again, I've emphasised gross proceeds there, means that if there were any selling expenses incurred, then you would deduct those selling expenses in deriving the net proceeds. Then you deduct your full original allowable cost. OK, let's see how we get on, therefore, with example two. And again, just a, that's the same example as we did in chapter 12, except now we're dealing with a company, JM Limited, making the sales rather than just an individual JM. What we've got to do, calculate the net chargeable gains or losses arising for JM Limited in March 2019, because the company sold the following assets in March 19. And again, what I'd like you to do, hopefully without reference back to chapter 12, but looking at what we have here, I'd like you to look at each of those four situations and determine what needs to be done. Now, that will sometimes require calculations. It will sometimes require no calculations. But I'd like you to have a think before I take you through this about what each of those outcomes, A, B, C and D, will lead to in terms of any calculations to be made any statements to be made. So again, pause at this point while you consider that particular issue. OK, let's see how you've fared, therefore, in terms of your analysis. The diagnosis that you must here come up with is in relation to each situation. Is there any gain or loss to compute, i.e. is it chargeable or are we dealing with an exempt disposal? If it is exempt, then if it's a written question, that's all we need to write. Or are we dealing with a calculation where either a gain or loss arises? And if we are, when dealing with chattels, you need to know what the specific rule is. Of course, as we said back in Chapter 12, when you work this type of problem in an exam question, what you've got to be very careful about, as we've said, in fact, through these chapters on corporate tax, is who is doing the selling. Are we dealing with a company as we are here? therefore involving indexation allowance where appropriate? Or are we dealing with uh, an individual who is doing the selling? This is a corporate disposal that we're dealing with. You also have to know the type of asset being sold. It doesn't say a chattel was sold for this or for that. It gives you an example of a chattel, an antique table, a painting, an antique vase, a vintage car, tangible, movable property. But you've got to recognise that the chattel rule is the point of the question. If you don't recognise it as a chattel, then you're not going to come out with the right answer. So what does your analysis come up with here? The first one, an antique table. Cost £3,000, sold for £5,000. Each of those numbers, of course, is less than, I hope you're saying now, £6,000. Therefore, that is exempt. There's no gain or loss to compute there. Part B, a painting which had cost £2,000, 
a figure less than 6,000, again, but is sold for 10,000. So, a painting is a chattel where, although bought for less than 6,000, is sold for more than 6,000. That is where, of course, two gains calculations must be performed. An actual gains calculation and a maximum gain calculation that, if lower than the actual, will limit the gain chargeable to that maximum figure. C. An antique vase cost 8,000, more than the 6,000 chattel exemption, but was sold for 3,000, less than the 6,000 chattel exemption. What does that mean? It means that these gross proceeds are deemed to be £6,000, the level of the chattel exemption. So a loss is to be computed, a loss there will arise. And finally, D, a vintage car. Now, we don't care whether it's vintage or anything else. Motor vehicles available, usable for private use there. Here, a car, that whether it's vintage or brand new, doesn't make any difference. A car is an exempt asset. Therefore, there is neither gain nor loss to compute. Yet again, for a different reason, of course, but this is exempt. So we've only got two calculations to perform in relation to items B and items C there. We know our indexation factors. This time I haven't troubled you by giving you separate indexation factors to March 2019. We know already that that would be irrelevant. We go to December 17, which of course is what you see listed here. We only go as far as December 17. OK, so B, the first one to work out, a painting which had cost 2000 in January 11 sold for £10,000. Remember, two calculations to perform, actual gain and then also the maximum gain calculation. So what will our actual gains calculation read? Do we know what we sold it for? Yes, we sold it for £10,000. Less cost. Do we know what we paid for it? Of course we do. Cost £2,000. Who's doing the selling? It's a company. Then away from the unindexed gain, i.e. 10 minus 2, the 8000 unindexed gain, we'll deduct indexation allowance. When did we buy? January 11. January 11 through to December. Didn't mean to cross that out, meant to underline it. But January 11 to December 17 equals 0 0.285. That will be applied, remember, to the allowable cost. You will then deduct that cost in deriving the chargeable gain. Now, although that is the actual chargeable gain, it may then be restricted to your maximum gain calculation. What is that? Your maximum gain calculation equals 5 over 3. That's the arbitrary fraction that you have to remember. Multiplied by what were the gross proceeds we sold for 10,000 minus what is the chattel exemption limit? It, of course, is 6,000 and establish the outcome for it. If that figure is less than the actual gain, you will use that maximum gain figure. If the actual gain is lower, you will simply stick with the actual gain figure. In relation to part C, our antique vase cost 8,000, sold for three. Well, we know that a loss here will arise this is not exempt because one or other of the cost or the proceeds here, the cost is bigger than the £6,000 chattel exemption limit. But what we do, of course, is we simply deem the gross proceeds to be 6000 Gross proceeds, 6000 cost, 8000 loss, £2,000. And that stops at that point in time. Remember why. Well, let's just review our answers to this here in the back. There's your antique table. That, of course, is exempt, so neither gain nor loss to derive. 
your painting, non-wasting chattel, more about wasting assets later, but normal calculation, proceeds, cost equals your unindex gain. Sorry about this, hopefully it will have disappeared from the version that you are looking at now. But we know our indexation factor. We no longer have to compute those indexation factors. Apply it to your allowable cost, get your indexation and derive your actual gain. But that, of course, is restricted to five thirds of your gross proceeds minus 6,000. Now, in this example, there were no selling expenses. If there'd been selling expenses, you'd have deducted them there directly from the proceeds in computing your actual gain. But in your maximum gain calculation, it's five thirds of, in brackets, gross proceeds minus £6,000 without any reference there to the selling expenses. In terms of the antique vase, disposal proceeds deemed to be 6000 the cost is eight, the loss is two. Remember, there is no indexation allowance available here. Why? Because indexation allowance cannot serve to either increase nor to create a capital loss. So we do not have indexation allowance contributing in any way to a loss figure. And finally, of course, there, the vintage car, as we know, were exempt. So the disposals that created any chargeable disposals, we have a gain limited to 6667. We have a capital loss limited to the actual loss made of 2000. So we have net gains. So for the company's chargeable accounting period, in which those disposals fell, will be showing a net gain in the corporate tax computation of £4,667. OK, have a look through. Make sure you're happy with each of those parts of this before we take it any further. OK, on now to the last of the, well, revision areas, stuff that we've covered already when dealing with individuals back in Chapter 12 when looking at capital gains tax. And what we've now got is a non-chattel wasting asset. A wasting asset. Now, again, if you've read through Chapter 12, the relevant section, you'll know what we're talking about. A wasting asset, an asset with a life of no more than 50 years. Now, when we have such an asset disposed of by a company, again, we're going to deal with the same principles, the same rules, the same way as we dealt with it as for individuals back in Chapter 12. But of course, now with the added deduction of indexation allowance on the allowable cost. Now, of course, on this basis, what we will do is we'll take a look back now at what the note was in Chapter 12. Just remind ourselves, though, of the problem. A typical such non-chattel wasting asset would be a copyright. That is a, again, not a tangible asset and uh, therefore is not covered by the uh, chattel rules. It's a non-chattel, but it is a wasting asset. It's going to have a life of no more than 50 years. Now, the issue, what do we say at the beginning of this uh, chapter? What we said that the main problem in computing a chargeable gain is determining allowable cost. So we buy an asset with a life of 20 years remaining in it. We sell it 12 years later when it's got eight years remaining life. Well, what we're selling has now only got a life of eight years as compared to when we bought it, it had a life of 20 years. What is that going to do to the value? It is clearly, therefore, going to reduce the value. Now, it's not just the passage of time that will dictate values of assets. It will be how valuable the asset, asset is in its own right. That copyright, what is it on? Is it something that is now worth more than it was when we originally bought it. But the point is that as the life of that wasting asset ticks away, as it gets ever closer to the end of its life, there's going to be a reduction in terms of the value. And what that means is to HMRC that if the value of the asset is going down, then so too in computing any chargeable gain will we reduce the allowable cost from whatever the original cost figure happened to be. So it's the nature of that reduction, that calculation of allowable cost, 
that is the new component, as it were, but actually for you is not a new component because we dealt with it in chapter 12. So we'll look at that chapter 12 note here. Now again, example that we usually have of a wasting acid, remember wasting acid, life of no more than 50 years, that is not a chattel, is a copyright. And that's the example we'll be looking at in a moment. So the allowable expenditure that we incurred on it is deemed to waste away over the life of the asset. So when a disposal is made, the allowable expenditure is restricted to take account of the asset's natural fall in value as time goes by. This fall in value is deemed to occur on a straight line basis over its predictable useful life. So how do we work out the allowable cost? What we do is we pick up, of course, the starting point is the original cost that was incurred when we bought that particular asset. And what we then do is notice here, I've underlined it multiple times, we then reduce that by this calculation that we'll see in a moment's time. So this is the reduction in that original cost. So the calculation here that we see using again this little equation, this is the reduction to apply to be deducted from the original cost. This calculation is not of the allowable cost. It's the deduction from the original cost to give you the allowable cost. So what have we got? P over L. The period of ownership of the seller over the original predictable life of the asset when this seller had originally acquired. So basically, how much of the life of this asset has the current owner used up? What is the period of ownership there that that has used up? Multiplied by. Now, it may very well just be by the cost of the asset, because the asset may have no value at the end of its life. But S here that we take away from that original cost is either the scrap or residual value at the end of the asset's predictable life, if there is one. Again, you see questions will include, as I will have included in the question you're about to have a look at. But again, do remember, the problem here, we know how much we sell it for. Our problem is that we know the original, total, original cost. What we've got to work out is the allowable part of that cost, given that we have to apply a reduction to the cost that we incurred relevant and relative to the amount of the life of the asset that we have already consumed. And only what remains will effectively be the allowable cost. So you're going to have to memorise this formula. You're going to have to learn it. That's the sort of thing, of course, you do closer to exam date there. Understand now how to apply and use that, but learn it rather closer to the date. Right, let us return to our note here in corporate tax and the example that we have got to deal with. Calculate the chargeable gain arising on the sale of the copyright in March 2019. On the 1st of March 2007, Z limited. Remember in an exam, an OT, an objective testing question there, you don't know who is dealing, who is the, uh, uh, the seller, who is dealing with the disposal of the asset, nor what it is that is being disposed of. So the first thing we've sorted out, as we always do, who's doing the selling? This time it's Z limited, so this is a corporate tax chargeable gains issue, not an individual CGT issue. Bought a copyright. Ooh, where's it gone? Bought a copyright here. You've got to recognise that the copyright is a wasting asset and therefore we have to reduce, we have to depreciate its cost. What was the original cost? £25,000. At that date, the 1st of March 07, it had an estimated useful life of 30 years and an estimated residual value of £1,000. Z Limited sold the asset for £38,000 on the 1st of March 19. Now, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, but hang on a minute. We only bought it for £25,000 and now years later we're selling it for more. 
we thought that this cost, this sorry, the value would go down, which is why we depreciate the cost. Well, no, the value doesn't necessarily go down. What you have the right to, that copyright that you now have, is more valuable. You know, things sometimes things are popular, sometimes they are not. And therefore, whatever you sell it for by comparison to the cost, we still do exactly the same calculation of allowable cost. So we know the sales proceeds, 38,000 on the 1st of March 19. Therefore, again, haven't messed around here with alternate indexation factors. We know that we want it from March 07 when acquired through to as a latest date, December 17. And the indexation factor is 0.436. So we know the sale proceeds, 38,000. We know the original total cost, 25,000. We know from it we need to take a reduction to get allowable cost. And when we've got that allowable cost, we can also use it by applying an indexation factor to get the indexation allowance to bring us down to our chargeable gain. So how we'll go about this problem. As we've just said, proceeds 38,000, from which we then need to deduct the allowable cost. So what was our original acquisition cost? 25,000 pounds. That then needs to be reduced by. Now remember what the calculation was. Let me show you again. P over L, the period of ownership of the seller over the predictable life of the asset on acquisition. Well, we know, of course, as per the question, that when bought, an estimated useful life of 30 years. When bought was the 1st of March 7. When sold, the 1st of March 19. Therefore, what here in our calculation is P, the period of ownership of the seller, that is 12 years, over what was the predictable life of the asset on acquisition? Well, that was 30 years. And we need to multiply that by. Now then, what do we take? Again, remind yourself of that. Cost minus scrap or residual value. What was the original cost of the asset? Again, just to go back to the question, bought for 25,000. What is its residual value? one thousand pounds therefore twenty five thousand minus one thousand there we take twelve thirtieths of that that is the deduction to take away from that original cost of twenty five thousand to give you the allowable cost once you've got the allowable cost take it away from the proceeds to give you an index gain and then pick up your indexation factor and within your indexation allowance calculation, apply that factor to the allowable cost that you've computed. Take it away from the unindex gain and you've got the chargeable gain. So I'd like you then just to follow that through and to work that answer through, please, here for this problem. And then rejoin us. We'll have a quick review of that before then moving to the final part of uh, this particular chapter, which is dealing with... Uh, a new subject for us that we haven't covered back in CGT, but may be applicable to individuals as well as being applicable to companies. But we're dealing with it once here, and that's here in this uh, corporate tax section. Dealing with the fact that a disposal, a chargeable disposal, may occur other than by means of a sale. And that is, unfortunately, as per our introduction, in chapter 19 to corporate tax and capital gains and that is the asset may be damaged it may even be lost or destroyed how do we deal with that but again you work through example three and then join us again in a moment okay let's just review this answer to bring this particular lecture to uh, a close and that will leave just the final section dealing with assets damaged or lost or destroyed there to look at in the uh, final lecture on this chapter. But here in example three, we knew that we'd sold the copyright for 38,000. We knew its original cost was 25. The problem here, the one new component 
is the reduction that we apply in that original cost. Looking at, as we've said, the number of years of life that the seller had of that asset over what was the useful life when it was acquired and take that fraction, basically the part of the life that we have consumed, taking that fraction of the original cost figure but minus any residual or scrap value if there is any. Take it away, that will equal your allowable cost. That is then used by applying the indexation factor through to December 17 on this occasion, as of course the disposal is later. Get your indexation allowance and you've got your chargeable gain. Okay, again, the only new bit, memorising, learning that calculation there. That is something that you do, as I suggested, closer to exam date. OK, that, as we said, brings this session to a close. And in our final session on this chapter, we just deal with that slightly new area of dealing with a different way, a rather unfortunate way, we may think, of disposing of an asset where either it's damaged. So if it's damaged, you still have that. It still has value. So that might, as you'll see soon, be represented as a part disposal, or if it's lost or destroyed, well, that's an outright disposal. How do we deal with the capital gains elements on those issues? We'll look at that in our next session together.